Glenn Youngkin has been elected as governor in Virginia. Whatever you think of Glenn Youngkin, his election was surely aided by rival groups sending pretend racists to smear him last week. Is it any wonder we're losing faith in politics when all these theatrical pranks are going on? Mm -hmm. Glenn Youngkin has been elected as Virginia's next governor days after the Lincoln Project was condemned for a stunt target in the Republican in which it sent people mimicking white nationalists to stand outside his campaign bus. It's a strange, theatrical and unnecessary prank to pull. Terry McAuliffe aides were quick to tweet out a photo, one declaring, this is who Glenn Youngkin supporters are, and another calling it disgusting and disqualifying for the Republican. Now, I'm sure that if I were to look into Glenn Youngkin, there'll be plenty of things that he believes in and agrees with that I am totally against. I bet there are loads of things because I'm politically as far as you can get from being Republican, I would say. But what I do believe in is free speech, authenticity, and people having the right to choose whatever political solutions they want. And I also believe the power should be as close to people as possible. And when you get to a point where the party posing as the goodies are sending out bogus white nationalists at such a sensitive time. I mean, that's outrageous. There's no upside to that. Consultants at the Lincoln Project were among those defending its actions. How can you defend that? How could you defend? Yeah, but all right, we did send some pretend white supremacists, but there are real white supremacists, but those real white supremacists are wily and sly and keeping out of the way. The men reportedly approached Youngkin's bus saying, we're all in for Glenn, but will they burn the candidate they were trying to help? I think the whole episode around the tiki torches was pretty unpleasant and ugly. And ordinary people from different cultural or racial backgrounds with different identities turning on one another is one of the things that upsets me most about modern cultural life. We have so much more in common than we have that separates us. There are doubtless conversations that have to be had about race, class, inequality in all sorts of areas. And I think people trying to score political points trying to get a candidate into office using the paraphernalia and imagery of a tense and fraught time is pretty unpleasant. For example, think about how liberal left media is responding around the Let's Go Brandon thing, which I think has an air of lightness. It's not such a, like a visceral, Rrr. that Tiki Torches moment was nasty. I don't think that's got any place anywhere. And dragging up Trump, man, the whole time, I don't know that this is a good way to progress, whilst I recognise that Trump did advocate for this particular candidate. And certainly, I'm not coming at this from a perspective of, oh, Youngkin, he might be the future. The only thing I can think of is his name rhymes with pumpkin. In a state where Biden beat Trump by 10 percentage points, many are viewing the contest as a bellwether for Democrats in the midterms and possibly beyond, and another referendum on Trumpism. Since getting the nomination, Youngkin has been keeping the former president at arm's length, but the torchbearers were trying to force the issue. Polls have them neck and neck. Right, we now know that Youngkin won, and we also know that Virginia's badge is someone standing on top of another person in a moment of weird Grecian triumph. The point that I'd like to draw your attention to are the cycles of politics, the pledges and promises that are frequently made and seldom fulfilled that we can already see playing out in the Biden administration. Let's have a look at some historical examples using a piece of writing from that right-wing fascist hate rag, The Guardian in England. David Sirota wrote, Amid the 2008 financial pandemic, there was a glimmer of something better. Barack Obama, who had campaigned on an inspiring promise to bring a new era of responsibility and accountability to Wall Street and Washington. Obama had helped the Bush administration forge the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Like, that's a nice name for it, isn't it, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. If you dive into what went down around that time, it was people making irresponsible bets. It was people endorsing deals that they knew were dodgy as fuck. The whole thing was basically crime. It was crime within the bounds of the law. And they deal with it with a whole, oh, we better get the Troubled Asset Relief Program. All that means is everything's been annihilated, but we are so exposed by this, we're going to have to hold it together and... That will be at the expense of ordinary people. But if we give it a nice name, like the Troubled Asset Relief Program, perhaps no one will notice. Soon after, the Wall Street bankrolled Obama administration scaled back its economic stimulus plan, backed off its promise to reform bankruptcy laws, refused to prosecute bankers, abandoned legislation to limit the size of too big to fail banks and allowed bailout money to subsidise lavish executive bonuses. I think it's the last one that causes most offence lavish executive bonuses. They weren't even moderate. 
lavish with a fling of the wrist, thusly. Now, anyone that's been awake and alive long enough to have seen how that played out will be susceptible to different political ideologies and models, even if they're purely rhetorical. If political figures and movements emerge where people say, drain the swamp, you can't trust these people, they make all these promises and they don't come good on them, what, is that an unreasonable thing to say? Or is that a very appealing thing to hear? The top 10% of income earners saw their fortunes rise by 27% during Obama's presidency. That compares, doesn't it, to the increase in wealth of the most wealthy during the pandemic period. Do you see how things are going? Do you see how the system is behaving? Do you see that focusing your attention on figures like Joe Biden, Donald Trump, anyone that operates within the system is ultimately unhelpful because the system can sustain the fluctuations of individual political figures because there are entrenched institutions and systemic ideologies that do not alter as a result of a ticky torch here or a bit of nationalist rhetoric there. These are deep entrenched systems that know how to preserve themselves and one of the main ways they preserve themselves is by turning us against one another on the basis of somewhat spurious ideas even though I have nothing but respect for civil rights struggles as much as I can understand them. The top 10% saw their fortunes rise, but every other stratum saw income decline and countless neighbourhoods were eviscerated by more than 6 million foreclosures. If that was caused by hurricanes or weather, it would be a massive disaster. It was caused by economics, which I don't want to sound like an ignoramus, but you have to acknowledge it's a construct, it's conceptual, it's manageable, you can redefine it. You these experiences repeated ad nauseum as Wall Street executives swelled their stock portfolios, convinced many to view the past promises of hope and change as a ruse. Why would you not? It just makes me realise that however whooped up and zooped up you get about an individual, ultimately they're going to let you down because they're going to be operating within systems that preserve themselves at all costs. It's naive to care about the individual uh, characters in the soap opera of contemporary politics. For today's Democrats, the takeaway is when America votes for hope and change and is instead force fed more of the same, the backlash can be swift. A dozen years later, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said at the outset of the Biden presidency that we will not repeat that mistake of watering down legislation. But let's see what really happened. However, much of the direct aid in child tax credit legislation has been stalled, cut off or scheduled for expiration, even as nearly one in five households lost all of their savings during the pandemic. Worse, Biden and the Democrats have been considering big cuts to their already scaled back package of housing, anti-poverty and climate initiatives. They've also pondered defanging provisions to reduce drug prices and considered adding means testing and work requirements that could make direct aid more difficult to access. All that is, is they rolled back on all their promises. When you watch any of them talk, I think the stuff they say is like really beautiful, whether it's like Theresa May, former prime minister in my country, Bill Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama. They say stuff that they know we need to hear. We're going to build a better country for you as an individual where you, your family and your community will come together and succeed, where people from all backgrounds will be able to achieve something in America that stands for ordinary people against corporations. They'll just say that stuff all day long. But once they're in, right, get rid of that tax credit thing. Yeah, we're not going to do that, uh, that anti poverty or climate initiative, we're scaling back. That's what happens all the time. So why should you vote? Why should you care? Why should you get excited? Almost 4 million jobs created since the election. More Americans are now employed than ever recorded before. We've created more than 400,000 manufacturing jobs. Remember when President Obama said you can't have manufacturing jobs anymore? These are the best jobs. You know, manufacturing, they're like the best jobs, the most important jobs. Manufacturing jobs growing at the fastest rate in more than 30 years. When I took this over, I'm telling you, it was a sick puppy. We were headed down. So last quarter, we hit GDP 4.1, adjusted upward 4.2%, right? Look, point, point, point. Look at this. New unemployment claims recently hit a 49-year low. You know what that means? Simple. That means people are working. They're working. You know this, you've been hearing, and now it's even better. African-American unemployment has recently achieved the lowest rate 
ever recorded. Hispanic American unemployment is the lowest rate in history. Asian American unemployment recently achieved the lowest rate ever recorded in our history. Women's unemployment, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, recently reached, I'm sorry, only the lowest rate in 65 years. That's not as good, that's not as good as history. But youth unemployment recently hit the lowest rate in nearly 50 years. Veterans unemployment recently reached its lowest rate in numerous decades, whatever that may be. Almost 3.9 million Americans have been lifted off food stamps. I mean, how good is that? We have companies now under the Pledge to America's Workers. They're training under our vocational programs. Workers, there's never been anything like this. We have retail sales surge last month, up over 6% over last year. We signed the biggest package of tax cuts and reforms in the history of the United States. Okay. As a result of the tax bill, small businesses will have the lowest top marginal tax rate in more than 80 years. That's not bad. Through a little work and a little coordination, the United States bid for the 2028 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. We got it. We just got the U.S., Mexico, Canada. We just got the World Cup in 2026. We enacted regulatory relief for community banks and credit unions so they can now go and loan you money again. Last month, the FDA approved more affordable generic drugs than ever before in its history. And one of the things we did with the FDA is a thing called, I love the name, Right to Try. You know what that is? This country for 50 years would not let you use that drug. They'd say, no, it may harm you. Well, you're terminally ill. I got it done. It's called Right to Try. Now you have the right to try, and it's gonna work plenty. It's a big thing. We just secured $6 billion for the new funding to fight the opioid epidemic, six billion. We withdrew the United States from the job-killing, income-killing Paris Climate Accord. I'm an environmentalist. I want crystal clean water. I want crystal clean air. That's what we want. But I also want jobs to come to our country. To this, we confirmed more court judges, think of this, than anybody. And we're gonna get, we just got Neil Gorsuch, I told you. We're gonna get Brett. We've got great people. Look at this. We moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner is Donald Trump. Oh. Now they're crying more than ever, except, you know, they're torn. Number one, they're crying, but they're making more money than they ever made because of us, because their stocks are. So I could go on for page after page after page. Look at that, page after page. And to me, a big thing. We're renegotiating the worst trade deals ever made by any country at any time. It's obvious that emotive cultural issues are brought to the forefront to inspire passion because it's impossible to be passionate otherwise because we've had the experience of the blag for the last 30, 40, 50 years. So that you have to be stoked up on wild, visceral fear and desire. Otherwise, you would quite rightly, sensibly and rationally, turn your back on these corrupt, defunct systems and start thinking about alternatives.
Taken together, it feels like 2009 all over again. Billionaires are doing better than ever, while more and more Americans are getting economically pulverized. Nice language. And simmering with rage. Just a year out from the midterm election, the latest polls show Biden's approval rating plummeting with particular erosion among Democratic constituencies who were promised change but seem to be feeling they're only getting more of the same. And what solutions are being offered? If you hear people shouting, let's go, Brandon, for God's sake, stamp that out. Stamp out the symptoms of people's dissatisfaction and never deal with the problem of the dissatisfaction and what's causing it. Until we become willing to forgive and love one another, turn to spiritual values instead of phony political values, we're not going to make any progress and it's going to be something that requires all of us together to get in conversation and it's a conversation that I'd like to start right now with you in